Welcome to the Washington Journal, Todd Tucker, who is the research director with the Global Trade Watch. Good morning. Thanks very much for being with us. And uh, Daniel Griswold, who is with the Cato Institute. Thank you for being with us. Uh, let me begin by asking you what impact uh, you think NAFTA will have on the U.S. economy. Well, it's been in effect for 15 years, and uh, I think the impact has been positive on our economy. Uh, but more importantly on our foreign policy. It was never going to have a big effect on the U.S. economy. The U.S. is 17 times larger than Mexico. Our trade barriers were already pretty low. We had the Maquiladora system uh, up and running, but it's really been a foreign policy success. It has deepened our ties to Mexico and Canada, basically built the bonds of friendship between our two closest neighbors. Mexico is a different country than it was 25 years ago. It's a vibrant, multi-party democracy. They are on the road to modernization economically and politically, and NAFTA's played an important role in that. So I think it's been a, a modest success. Todd Tucker, is it working? Well, I think when you take agreements like NAFTA combined with the World Trade Organization, which is a global pact, uh, you see that we've the United States economy has had burgeoning trade deficits over this period uh, and the loss of 5 million manufacturing jobs. Now, not all of that is due to NAFTA or the WTO, but a significant chunk of it is, as well as the rise in inequality. And I think that uh, the real purpose of, of PACs like NAFTA and to some extent the World Trade Organization as well uh, is to make the world safe for multinational, multinational corporations, uh, to give them enhanced rights uh, in developing countries, to be able to challenge environmental policies and other public interest laws. I, I want to ask you to explain the numbers. This from the U.S. Trade Association. In 2008, uh, $1.1 trillion in U.S. goods and services between the U.S. and our NAFTA partners. Uh, that's about $482 billion in exports, comparing to 2009, where it was $204 billion in U.S. exports to Canada. Well, of course, the recession had a lot to do with those trade numbers. But over the history of NAFTA, our trade has grown faster with our NAFTA partners than trade overall. NAFTA was never going to cure the trade deficit. And I don't think the trade deficit's as big a problem. Imports are a great blessing to low- and middle-income uh, American families. And NAFTA's had virtually nothing to do with the shakeout in manufacturing. In fact, the first five or six years after the passage of NAFTA, Steve, they were some of the best years in our economy's history. We added half a million net manufacturing jobs. Manufacturing output was up 30 percent. The recent troubles we've had have more to do with the recession and, and business cycles. NAFTA's been a modest success for the U.S. It wasn't just about corporations. Our investment in Mexico has been a pretty modest $2 billion a year compared to $160 billion a year invested in the U.S. economy in our manufacturing base. So the giant sucking sound that Ross Perot predicted never happened. happened. NAFTA has been good for the United States, good for our foreign policy primarily. Has it been good for jobs? Well, it was never going to have any effect on the unemployment rate one way or another. And, and you know, the 15 years after NAFTA, we've had a lower average unemployment rate than we had in the 15 years before NAFTA. What it's done is it cr it's created better jobs. It's created better paying jobs, higher level jobs. Yes, some jobs have moved to Mexico and other countries, but they tend to be the, the lower paying manufacturing jobs. So NAFTA has helped us modestly move up, but it's been a great help for Mexico getting on the road to modernization both economically and politically. you agree or disagree with that? Well, you know, I think that uh, the, real, the real factor is that when NAFTA was passed, what the members of Congress that voted for it were promised was that we were going to have greater exports and a, an increasing trade surplus with Mexico, and that that was going to lead to the creation of hundreds of thousands of jobs. In fact, we've seen bilateral deficits grow and jobs, uh, manufacturing jobs lost along with that. So I think that, uh, you know, it would be nice if, uh, if we could sort of agree now that th there was no such promise. But in fact, these promises were made, and, the prom and it hasn't worked out. Uh, as, as the advocates of NAFTA had, had committed. And now we're talking about having NAFTA-style pacts with tiny countries like Panama. What, what's the possible job, job creation reason for doing a trade agreement with Panama? There really isn't one. So it is a lot more about protecting the U.S. companies that, are, that have subsidiaries there that want to take advantage of the deregulation-promoting provisions. But couldn't you argue that that relationship is stronger? You take, for example, Ford or General Motors, uh, where parts of the cars are made in Windsor and Toronto, Canada, shipped across uh, to the U.S. and vice versa. We then ship our cars to Canada for, for sale in, in that country and, of course, cars being sold in Mexico and around the world. 
Yeah, and there's certainly nothing wrong with increased trade. I think that the, the question but is... But doesn't that create more jobs for, for the certainly, U.S.? Certainly. And, and, and increased exports create jobs for the U.S., and imports can also have a beneficial impact as well. I think the debate when it comes to trade agreements is trade under what rules. And I think that that's really where the debate is now. What are the best rules to govern the global economy? Where would you draw the line on those rules? Well, I think these trade agreements create uh, uh, rules of the road that have benefited Americans. Let's not demonize multinational companies. Millions of Americans work for them. They're good-paying jobs. Foreign investment is increasingly a way we reach uh, foreign, foreign uh, customers. And, you know, in this recession, one of the things that didn't happen in this last recession is we didn't engage in the kind of 1930s protectionism that was so destructive during the Great Depression. And these trade agreements, the WTO, NAFTA, they helped uh, politicians resist the temptation of engaging in protectionism. And let's not dismiss increased trade. You know, Canada and Mexico are now the number one and number two export markets for most states. Canada is mm -hmm. the number one export market for 35 states. In Ohio, which was a, a focal point uh, during the recent campaign, uh, 280,000 manufacturing jobs depend on exports, most of those to Canada and Mexico. Uh, let's not demonize trade with our closest neighbors. They've produced good-paying jobs. They've deepened our foreign policy relations with our two closest neighbors. Our topic is NAFTA. Our two guests, Todd Tucker, who is the research director with the Global Trade Watch. You can log on to the website at citizen.org slash trade. And Daniel Griswold of the Cato Institute. Cato.org is the website. Susan is joining us from Juneau Beach, Florida, on the Republican line. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, to the gentleman on the left from the Cato Institute, could you please tell me who funds your organization? Yeah, Cato is funded entirely by private donations, more than 80 percent of them from individuals who share our belief in limited government, uh, free markets, individual liberty, a peaceful uh, foreign policy, and, and most of those come in the form of checks of $100 and $500. We get virtually no support from corporations, very, very small, no support from government. So we are entirely independent and nonpartisan. Has any nation, this is directed to you, uh, Mr. Griswold, any nation become more prosperous without free trade? Well, it's pretty hard to find. Uh, the, the richest, most prosperous nations in the world uh, are those that are open to the global economy and trade with their neighbors. Uh, some of the poorest, most pathetic, and most dangerous nations, like North Korea, uh, are isolated from the global economy. So uh, trade is an important part. It's not the only part. It's not a magic bullet. Uh, but it's an important part of development and prosperity and broader freedoms in, political, in the political and civil arena as well. And this viewer is saying uh, NAFTA has helped kill off our manufacturing base. Well, I think, again, the promise was that it was going to be a great boon to our manufacturing base, and I don't think that that has been the result at all. Uh, and certainly when you look at public opinion polls and the attitude across the country, there's strongly the feeling that NAFTA and agreements like the WTO have had a detrimental impact on our uh, manufacturing base. Steve, can I just jump Absolutely. in quickly there? Let's not let, let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, we are manufacturing more today than we were before NAFTA was passed. We're doing it with fewer workers because there's so much more productive. So we have a strong manufacturing base, just as we have a strong man, uh, agricultural sector. But we've just gotten so much more efficient. So U.S. workers are manufacturing more stuff than they were 15 years ago. We're just manufacturing more and better stuff, and NAFTA is part of the reason why. I worked in, in the fashion industry for years, and I know when we imported, it was uh, accessories. So when we imported leathers that we didn't manufacture here, it was a lower tariff than if we imported something made of cotton. We protected those, man, those man, that manufacturing base and that part of our economy. Did you want to respond? It, it is on the caller's mind that somehow NAFTA and trade has decimated the U.S. manufacturing base. Steve, I wrote a book, a recent book for Cato called Mad About Trade, and I deal with this at some length. Here are some basic facts about mm -hmm. U.S. manufacturing. We are manufacturing about 30 percent more than we were when NAFTA passed in terms of volume, counting the stuff, output. Millions of pharmaceuticals and semiconductors, uh, automobiles, we still produce eight, nine, ten million automobiles a year, civil aircraft, uh, heavy appliances, 44 million heavy appliances made in the United States in 2008. We remain a manufacturing power. We are the world's number one manufacturing nation in terms of value added. There are five million fewer jobs, which of course gets the unions riled up because that's fewer members that they can uh, recruit and collect dues from. Uh, but we continue to be a manufacturing powerhouse and NAFTA has helped us move up 
the value chain. We're producing fewer shoes and shirts, T-shirts here in the United States, but those manufacturing jobs didn't pay that well. And we're producing more pharmaceuticals and semiconductors and higher end goods where the workers are more productive and they get better pay. Just to be fair, we're not making any U.S. clothes in the U.S. to speak We're of, making we? some. We're making some, but we import the majority. Uh, a comparison which of, means lower prices for consumers, by the way. A comparison of imports and exports between uh, the U.S. and Canada. Let's look at the numbers courtesy of the uh, U.S. Trade Representative. In 2009, the most recent numbers, we exported about $204 billion to Canada and about $130 billion to Mexico, compared to imports of about $225 billion uh, from Canada to the U.S. and about $176 billion from Mexico to the U.S. Yes, and the, if, if you're obsessed with exporting as much as you can and importing as little as you can, the trade deficit's a problem. But I think imports are good. In fact, imports are the most important for poor and middle-income American families who spend a higher share of their budget on shoes, clothing, food. You know, it's kind of ironic that some of my progressive friends who defend these trade barriers, they're really regressive taxes on the poorest Americans, picking their pockets every day through higher tariffs and costing us jobs, by the way. One reason Hershey and other confectioners are looking abroad is because of our sugar quotas that make them pay two and three times the world price for sugar. And by the way, NAFTA allows us to import sugar uh, quota free from Mexico. That's good for U.S. consumers and for U.S. workers. Alicia, joining us from Columbia, Maryland. Good morning on the Independent Line. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning. Uh, Mr. Griswell, you mentioned pharmaceutical companies. Don't you know that most of our uh, pharmaceutical companies have been bought up by foreign countries? And also, uh, everything, almost everything I use daily. In the morning when I eat my fruit, they're from Chile or from elsewhere. Even the thinner floss I use is from uh, Ireland and can candy. The only time I really like to eat those, you know, those ribbon candies and those other uh, rock candies, they're made in uh, Mexico, they're made in Canada. We do not produce, we hardly produce anything anymore. And, of course, it all started with our motels and hotels quite a, quite a number of years back. I don't even think we own our own of anything anymore. Sure, it looks like, you know, they're run by our own people, but most of them, America has been bought out. Wake up. Well, ma'am, I would just say uh, foreign investment is a good thing. We are better off because foreigners want to invest in the U.S. economy. In fact, there are over 5 million Americans who work for foreign-owned companies. Those jobs pay an average of 30 percent more than the, the average wage. Our, our assets, our companies are still overwhelmingly owned by Americans, but it's a good thing when foreigners want to invest in the U.S. A third of our automobile workers in the United States uh, work for uh, foreign-owned affiliates. You know, and, and this is also one reason why the uh, import-export picture seems a, a little skewed. The kind of things we import are useful consumer goods. I mean, just ask yourself where you and your family would be if you had to buy made in USA goods for all those basics. You'd be paying higher prices. You'd have less uh, left over to go out to eat and things like that, where the things we export tend to be chemicals, uh, jet engines, uh, semiconductors. They're not the kind of things consumers buy. So we remain an export powerhouse. We are the world's number one exporter in terms of goods and services. We are the world's number one manufacturer in terms of value added. It's just a different and higher mix, uh, more valuable mix of goods than we were producing 20 or 30 years ago. And how, do, how does a Youngstown or Detroit or Binghamton, New York, these towns that have been hit hard, whether it's NAFTA or other economic factors, uh, many of these communities have been decimated over the last 20 years. How do they come back? What does it take? Well, first, we need to recognize reality. It wasn't because of NAFTA. Youngstown, Ohio, and these other communities had been struggling for several decades. And to say that if we just get in and tinker with NAFTA, there's going to be some industrial renaissance uh, in Rust Belt America is just a, just a cruel hoax. I think the president's, uh, I think, basic demagoguery on the campaign trail against trade ran into the reality of governing this great nation. And I think the president and the advisors around him realize 
uh, that you can't serve the interests of the U.S. economy by raising trade barriers. Uh, that's going to cost us exports around the world. It's going to cost us good paying jobs in this country. It's going to complicate our relations uh, with other countries. Do you, Mexico and uh, Canada are our two closest neighbors. They're close foreign policy neighbors. Do you really want to start out your administration picking a gratuitous trade fight with them? Let me just say one, one final thing. Uh, the bottom line for trade policy is, does it serve the national interest? It shouldn't be, does it serve one or two or three narrow uh, economic sectors? Unionized workers in the private sector are now less than 8% of workers. 80% of Americans work in the service sector. How about a trade policy that benefits them? Let's not have the tail wagging the dog on our trade policy. Let's have a trade policy that delivers lower prices, better quality, more variety to the vast majority of Americans. And the bottom line is we need freer trade. Free trade is fair trade.